Test, test, test. Are we live? All right. Welcome, everybody, back to the class. It's been a while since we've done one of these, and we don't have any paper here at the church, a problem that I am going to rectify this week. But uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the church our media report for October. I'm going to try to start doing these monthly. I was doing them, like, bi-monthly just so the numbers would seem bigger. But, um... Well, I mean, you know, more numbers means bigger numbers, even though it's longer span of time. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and, uh, all right, so for, this is October 1st through the 31st. Um, where do I want to start? Let's start, let's start with Facebook. Facebook, we have had an additional 20 followers, 20 plus followers this month, which is good considering most months we've had zero additional followers uh, so that's good our reach on Facebook these are pe this is Facebook's estimated number of people that saw our posts um, was 815 for the month of October um, total uh, total page likes uh, has went up from I forget what the number was before but it's 557 and our total number of followers is 589 uh, for YouTube a platform that seems to be growing all of a sudden um, it, uh, we got 470 views on 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 YouTube and our number of subscribers have, has jumped up to 55 uh, our all-time views on Facebook this is a no, the total number from the entire time we've been doing it is up to uh, 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 7600 uh, yeah, 7,600 uh, 7, uh, total views. Um, the church website got 52 uh, unique visitors this month and 104 page views from four different countries. Um, that includes the United States, China, Germany, and France. Um, the visitors to date on the website is 2,848 unique viewers. And most popular content on our website it usually is these three, but it's in this order. The home page, which that sounds like, well, yeah, of course there is. If they're going to the website, of course there isn't the home page. But our home page has links to everything else that we do. So if they, they, if they use the home page as a landing page, there's a lot of stuff they can get to. So that is our most popular. And then live broadcast following directly our live broadcast page on the website. And then the what do we do page. And then the last thing, uh, this one I put to last because it's usually the largest, um, is Sermon Audio. Sermon Audio webcast this month, uh, and that is the live broadcast side of Sermon Audio, not the uploads side of Sermon Audio. Got 21 unique views, which doesn't sound like much, but we were single digits last time I checked it. Um, and those views are for uh, people that watch five minutes or more. So they at least had to be there and be watch, have eyeballs on for five minutes before it would count that view. Um, total interactions to date for Sermon Audio webcast is uh, 240 views. Total number of countries reached four. Those are you know, the United States, Canada, India, and the United Kingdom. Um, Uploads. This is usually the big one, and it was big this month as well. For October, uh, the uploads, this is audio files and video files of all of our content. We upload both now. Um, we got 870-plus downloads this month. Uh, a total downloads for uh, our lifetime of having a sermon audio account is uh, 19,373 downloads. Uh these down the 870 plus downloads were downloaded from 22 unique countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands, Spain, Canada, the Philippines, Cambodia, Slovenia, Kenya, the United Arab Emirate, Emirates, uh, Singapore, Japan, Italy, Cameroon, Germany, Romania, Malaysia, South Africa, and Myanmar. Uh, for this month. The total number of people that saw our content was uh, 2,217 plus, um, and the total number of countries that saw our content was 25 unique countries. So, a uh, lot of, uh, and our YouTube channel is really all of a sudden just like, I don't know if it's the consistent uploads or what it is, but our YouTube channel is like all of a sudden like doing significantly better. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, and I don't, I actually don't know how, I don't know how our YouTube, 
live streams, like how that affects the numbers. If those, if those, if the 407 views are included, unique views to videos, and if that, that's separated or if they're together, either way you look at it, there's people visiting the YouTube channel. Um, so uh, we uh, we've we've had a pretty good month, and the 870 to Sermon Audio, those are estimated. I actually haven't got the monthly report from Sermon Audio yet. It usually takes a week into the following month. For them to compile those numbers for me, but those are just my hand, just going, just going, scrolling through and viewing each thing, hand estimates. So those, and, and I was rounding to tens or rounding down to tens. So that's why I was saying plus because it's it's definitely more than that. Um, and in fact, I think our our highest down highest recently downloaded sermon on our sermon audio, uh, Brother Jarrett is part one of of the sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testaments. Uh, that one has gotten uh, has gotten 131 downloads on our uh, on our sermon audio page. So, um, pretty pretty good stuff. Any questions or comments about that? For yeah, that's that that it, that is that the the big number the 2217 that is a a compiling of all the different things that we that we've uploaded onto, so that's that's Facebook, that's YouTube, that's uh, our website and our uh, sermon audio page. Um, yeah, well, and you have to some some of this stuff, you, especially the countries thing, you have to take with a grain of salt. People that use VPNs can can cloak their identity. They could be people in the United States watching, but they can with a with a virtual proxy network. You can say I'm in X country, uh, and there are people that do that. Mostly, it's it's a privacy thing. It's to keep uh, the ISP from tracking you, your internet service provider. Uh, but even if half of those are true, um, and there are uh, specifically uh, Belgium. The, the Belgium one and what was the other one? Belgium and the Netherlands. For whatever reason, those they kept popping up when I was, like I said, just kind of scrolling through trying to find the different countries uh, that were there. The Belgium and the Netherlands kept popping up a lot. And if you see that, that and, and multiple downloads from those two, it's not just, it wasn't just like one unique download. It was like 10 or 15. Um, so those. I would be willing to say are probably less likely to be a VPN and more likely to be when you see it's like one country and it's this is the only time they've ever been downloaded from there and it's one download that's the one you got to be suspicious of because that's probably just somebody proxying but still that's uh it's uh it it we're, it's no matter where they downloaded it from it's still over two thousand downloads in a single month so. Uh, as you're preaching, as you're teaching, as you're going along, uh, remember that there are a whole, whole lot of people um, there uh, showing up to hear the Word of God. And that's what we're here to do this afternoon, uh, is uh, is uh, do our, uh, our class. Uh, we are still studying through the book of Psalms, and here as we enter the ninth psalm, I'm beginning to wonder if we undertook a cast that we will never achieve. Um, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it'll only take three years. I, I may not even be alive in three years. <laughs> um, but uh, let's go ahead and review what we talked about last time, and I will forgive you if you if you have trouble remembering because this would be two weeks ago because last week we were doing stuff to get the festival ready. Um, but Psalms chapter 8 who remembers what we talked about in that lesson Sister Donna yep we we, uh, we talked extensively about the other things that were lost other I mean and the big one being our uh, we, we, the death of our souls um, but the other things that we lost, in addition to the, um, in addition to that, the specifically dominion over the animals, and and I think, uh, among a whole lot of other things, that it was one of the the devil's kind of early test runs to start start trying to rob as much authority over things as possible. It seems, especially especially the way that the devil tempted, especially how the devil tempted Adam and Eve, the um, progenitors of the entire human race and how that he tempted Christ it seems that the 
way that you get authority is through worship. If you are worshipped by an authoritative figure, your authority supersedes theirs. You know, as we submitted, or Eve, us through Eve and Adam submitted to the word of an animal, and we lost we lost our dominion here. We lost our ability uh, to uh, to to hold to hold sway, and I think that's why animals attack us. <laughs> I think that's why I think that in in addition to our curse, I think that's why the earth doesn't get. That's why you can't just walk up on a wild animal and pet them on the back, is because they're they don't like us anymore. We we're not theirs, and that's also how the devil in the in the gospels was able to offer everything to Christ, is because he owned it. He he. We submitted to him through the serpent, and it all was his. And, and he had that power. But what would Christ have been giving up? By God submitting to the devil, if he had, if he had just fell down, that was all. He, you bow the knee, you worship me. Everything that you see is yours. All of it. You can, you can literally save, do everything that you want to do with one bow of the knee. But what would have been the fallout? It seems to say to, to state that that would have made Lucifer God. His, at least the the things that he had authority over would have made it would, it would have been at his feet, uh, and the devil, of course, likes to wreck um, headship orders and stuff like that. He he likes to he likes to get things out of the natural the natural alignment. So we talked extensively about that in chapter eight. Anybody anything else, uh, brother junior? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. See, and 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 that's why I always say when, when it, the entire Bible is a, it, all the way from Genesis to Revelation is a return to Eden. We are going to we're going to get back into a perfect harmony with God, where we can literally walk beside Him and hold His hand and and be there with Him. In addition to everything else will have perfect harmony too those you know creatures that were deemed wild or, or you know or whatever will be able to interact directly with them I don't honestly know how many carnivores were on this planet till the fall uh, yeah, pr- probably zero yeah uh, uh, it, we, we didn't we didn't the Bible actually says if you if you look at when he placed Adam and Eve in the garden what did he give them to eat it wasn't beasts it wasn't it said Fruit and trees and 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 stuff that grew out of the ground. That was that was supposed to be your mainstay. In fact, I actually read a thing that said Tyrannosaurus Rex, which they've got teeth this long, that they are, they actually there. Some scientists believe they actually weren't equipped to hunt at least initially meat because their teeth, the way that they were set in their jaws with their gums and everything, when they bit, when they pulled away, it would have ripped their teeth out. Would have ripped their teeth out of their mouths. Because those big old long steak knife you ever stuck a steak knife into something and then you kinda get that suction you pull back? That's basically what it, and they said that they may have been better equipped to for breaking branches and, and all that kind of stuff. They may have been herbivores uh, instead of instead of carnivore. Now how do we know <laughs> from bones? But but still, I I don't think that there was a lot of meat eating going on before the fall, and the fall kind of led to that. Yeah, brother. Jared? Good things are restored. Well, the lion will eat straw of the land. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, and you have to think in addition to when when the demons wanted to be cast out of legion, where do they want to go? They obviously Jesus wasn't going to let them enter into another person, but he went into the swine. They went, they went. Uh, the, everything around us is under Satan's direct control. He still holds authority. Now Jesus Jesus bought us back, but he's going to fight and he's going to win the world back. And I think you see that played out in Revelations because when he finally gets it all back, what do they do? They burn it. The Godhead burns it. And it's just like, we're done. We're going to cleanse it. We're going to get it nice and hot. We're going to burn off all the impurities. Satan is now in jail, in perma-jail. We don't, he's not, there's no uh, chance of him returning back. And then we're going to set up all new 
um, all, an all new version of what this was supposed to be before you people screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, all, all, he, new heaven and new earth is got to be has got to be Eden. I, and I personally think that um, new heaven might be where. God dwells, and I think New Earth may be where Jesus dwells. That's just my because God created. There's actually no account of God creating heaven as we know it, the abode of God. There's actually no record of him of him creating that. It would had to have existed before creation. If you look at Genesis, the only thing he creates are the stars that we can see. And then he creates all the things that you see around you. But he does not create the abode of God. They already had that. And I think there will be a new version, a new home. And I think that's where God will, that Jehovah God would will because he's always going to be higher. He's always going to be, he's the big picture guy. You know, he's the, he's the. Um, all right. Any other questions or comments on Psalm 8 before we move into Psalm 9? Psalms chapter 9, I think, is interesting. And I actually read something that said that, that the if you look at the superscription at the top of, at least mine has it in my Bible, uh, to the chief musician, Muth Laban, um, a psalm of David. Now, they, this one thing that I read said there's a Chaldean version of this same song, or written in Chaldee, uh, that, has, uh, that has, that says that it was... Um, Written, what did it say? Written upon the destruction of the champion that went between two camps, and it seems to reference Goliath. The the the, the you know you remember they had the the Philistines on one hill and the Israelites on another, and there was a valley in between. Every day uh, Goliath would go out and he would challenge uh, the people of God to come out and fight him, and so it is. Although there's no biblical evidence that I can tell just reading through here, uh, it's possible, based on this Chaldean inscription, that this might have been written pretty close after David's defeat of Goliath. And, and whenever we look at the Psalms, knowing, you know, again, they're, they, are, they are Hebrew songs. They are inspired songs because they're in our Bible. Um, but knowing kind of the time period they're written in definitely helps paint the color. Of of what the writer was was trying to get across at the time, uh, so uh, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will shew forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou Most High. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence, for thou hast maintained my right and my cause, and thou uh, stay uh, thou stayest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen, and thou hast destroyed the wicked, and thou, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destruction! Uh, uh, o thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorials perished with them. Now this opens up with a. Um, a moment of praise and a moment of thankfulness uh, to God. And he says, I, I will praise thee, I will praise thee with my whole heart. This was a pouring out of spirit, a pouring out of, and I hate to use this word because a lot of Baptists don't, but a pouring out of emotion, a pouring out of just gladness and thankfulness to God for what? Verse 3 tells you, for, for my, uh, when mine enemies are turned back. Now, if this was written after the battle with Goliath. If you remember, after David sliced off Goliath's head with his own broadsword, he led a charge up the hill, and the Philistines just turned. They just turned and ran. All of them were, and then you remember, all the Israelites came behind David, and it was a, 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 a victory. Now, this does seem to corroborate that inscription by saying that, that about these uh, turn back, and they shall fall and perish at thy presence. Now, these glad tidings, he doesn't say, I'm glad that you, that you let me do these things. He says, no, who turned them back? Who does he give credit for the victory that even David played? You would even say, if you read the story of David and Goliath, was it First, first Samuel chapter 16? If you read that, he played a 
integral role <laughs> in the in the but who but he says but at thy presence the, all these the, the, your enemies are, are turning because of you not because of me I am a tool and I am a uh, I am a um, a useful vessel for uh, for your work for thou hast maintained uh, my right and my cause thou stayest in the throne judging right now we return to this idea of judging now does anybody remember that back in Psalms chapter seven there's a lot about that. Uh, we talked uh, quite a bit about that, and if you remember, uh, um, verse four of chapter seven says, "If I have rewarded even to him that was at peace with me, yea, have I have delivered him that without a cause, uh, without cause is mine enemy. Let the enemy persecute my soul." Remember, he was calling for righteous judgment. He was calling for ju- even if that righteous judgment turned on him. And again, we see David calling upon. The righteous judge. He says, "Not only have you have you made the enemies to fall. He says, you are sitting at your throne, judging right. You are you are you are you are you are weighing in the balances and finding those that are wanting. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou uh, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. And then he goes on to talk about their utter destruction. David." at the battle uh, where he fought Goliath was at a monstrous disadvantage. We're talking we're talking a man who was what was in excess of nine feet tall. Um, I, I've done the calculations on his armor. His armor probably weighed more than most people in his in this room could pick up. Um, he had a man with a shield large enough he had a shield large enough that he had a man just carry that for him. Um, he had, he had, uh, weapons, uh, that, he had a spear that about had a two before, um, for the shaft of it. He was, he was a massive man, egregiously outmatched. And David recognizes this, and he'll go on, and he goes on in the, in his verse and talks about the destruction of those enemies is they are come to a perpetual end. Now, David, I think, is alluding here actually to what the Hebrews would have called Sheol, uh, to hell. He's re- he's referring to because he says that all my enemies, and I think specifically, he's re- if if this is a, story, a a psalm about Goliath, he's talking about Goliath. He's talking about the Philistines. They've come to a perpetual end. I think that's a very unique conflation of words to describe hell. Think about hell. Hell is an end for the sinners, but that word "perpetual" I think definitely seals in our mind the not only the finality but the eternity of that finality. A perpetual end. A I, I think probably I think even for saved people, the moment of death is going to be painful because your your soul's saved and and protected from it, but your flesh. Is still sinful and it still has to die. And I think death, even the, the quietest deaths that I've heard about, are probably not easy things for the flesh to endure. It's not supposed to be. Um, but for lost people, that moment of death, and I've heard people that, that fought death, and I've heard people that slipped out easily, but the ones that fight death, they're in misery. They're in terror. And that moment is stretched out forever in hell it's not only are you dying you're forever dying perpetual end how hot is hell hot enough to kill you and hot enough that in the moment right before you would die in any other fire you just keep on living perpetual end all of it but in this psalm that's a praiseworthy thing it's a good thing. David's glad. And that's a hard thing to wrap our head around. It's very easy, especially with certain people, to get vindictive and say, yeah, that, that, uh, of course that's a good end for them. I mean, think of all the horrible m- people that have martyred Christians over the years. It's like, yeah, that's a just and right end. But I don't think that's necessarily what David's saying is here. Is be- if you go back to the verse in verse 4 where he says, 
thou saddest in the throne judging right. It's not because it's what David wanted. It's not because David was getting some type of vengeance. It wasn't because uh, D David was glad that Goliath was now going to be locked in a place of eternal damnation. No, I think it was because that was the right place for them to be. Everything in its place and everything having its place. And vessels of honor and are, are created to be honorful. And I think David was one. But vessels of dishonor, like Goliath, they're created for perpetual end. A perpetual smashing of the vase, so to speak. A, per, a, 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 a forever punishment that is just as glorifying to God as David's praises were in verses 1 and 2. Sadly enough, and we talk about people that oh, people in foreign countries that have never heard the name of God. Why, why, why do they have to go to hell? Because God's not out to save everybody. If he was out to save everybody, God would have saved everyone. Because there's never been a thing that he's ever done that he's done poorly or not to the fullest of its effect. He's not out to save everyone. He is out to bring glory to who? Himself through his creations. We created our own problems. We continue to create our own problems. And because of that, because we're, and we talked just a few minutes ago about Eden and perfection, and, 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 and because we can't achieve that anymore, he has got to get as much glory from what is left as he possibly can, as, as is deserved of the God of heaven. And for some people, that deserved glory is eternal punishment. And I can't think of it being a great thing. I, you, I, you think about you think about the most innocent person you can think of without separating apart of of God saving them. They're still worthy of perpetual end. And I can't wrap my head around that. I don't understand it. I'm not. I'm. I, I don't. I don't think I have the ability. To fathom it because my emotions are greatly tied to a fallible part of myself but I do know that here it was a glor it was a glorifying thing perpetual end that I destroyed the seas and their memorial is perished with them now not only do they have perpetual end there's no memory of them there's there's no memory of of the uh, of the of the lost and and I, I, I think that's almost true of all flesh there are a handful of figures throughout history that have made marks large enough for us to see them thousands of years after the fact. But for as many as there are of those, there are thousands, millions, billions more that slip off into death with obscurity and are never seen again. Think of every, you know, we, we Goliath, the probably one of the more vile villains of the Old Testament, his name lives on through perpetuity. Why? Because God gains great glory from the telling and retelling of the story of him using a small, tiny shepherd boy to knock a nine-foot man on his bottom and then having his head cut off. That gets him great glory. But think about, for just a moment, every Philistine that was at that battle that remains nameless that also died. They slip into obscurity. Their memorial is perished. There is there there is no there there is no uh, uh, lighting of the candles. Or you, you know look at look at the tw the twin towers. There's big, big big memorials and there's flowers and people bring candles and all that stuff to remember that. But for the Philistines, there is none of that. For those people that died upon that battlefield, their don't their bones are dust. And that is just as glorifying to God as all the rest. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. Now, he, he, he brings all this back and says, Now, the one thing that will last, and this is something that we can file away and keep bringing out on a daily basis, the Lord will endure forever. Your soul, if you're saved, your soul is irrevocably tied to the Lord. It's as eternal as he is. More importantly, everything that's done for him, everything that works for him, I think has this lasting effect. Why are, you know, there's a lot of things from ancient times, especially the ancient times that the Bible talks about, that have not survived. But we have a book here that dates back before recorded history. Everything before the flood, none of it survived, people. We actually have a small, albeit like, what, six chapters, seven chapters, a very small record of, how, of what went down before there. 
Why? Because that's tied to God. And it's as eternal as He is. So think about your work, the things that you do for God, if they be any, and how that is going to endure, how that is going to last. Now, is it going to last like the Word of God has? Unfortunately, I don't think there's being any inspired scripture being written anymore, so it's not going to last like this. It's probably not even going to last in the same manner as you can open up uh, biographies and, and, and stuff of, 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 of missionaries or, or, or famous Christian people or martyrs or anything like that. I don't even think it'll probably last that, but the eternal fruits of your labor, they will bear out. They will. Paul, I think, is still reaping rewards for seeds that he sowed thousands and thousands of years ago. Uncle Christopher taught uh, uh, preached a very good message at the fellowship about almost kind of about this thing where he, he talked about he talked about come over to Macedonia and help us. A pivotal point in history. A one moment chance. Really, whether Asia would be witnessing to us or we would be witnessing to Asia. The Macedonian call brought Paul to Europe. Brought the word of God to you. That stuff still being bore out. Those moment-to-moment decisions that we make on the word of God, they have that level of impact, or can Lord will endure forever, and he said, "He, he says, he shall, he shall, um, uh, he hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of troubles." He says in verse eight that he shall judge the world in righteousness, and he will minister, he will minister judgment to people in uprightness. The only one that can judge is God. And he will get us all. He he will come to that judgment one way or another. I think that there is a temporary judgment for everybody. Whether you're saved or lost, your destination after you die, that's a foregone conclusion. That is actually the first level of God's judgment. You either are one of mine or you're not. You're in the apple barrel or you're out of it. The second thing is, though, there's there is going to be a re- and we talk, it talk, talks about was it Revelation chapter twenty? All the dead from every era, from the beginning of time to the end of time, all called before God, and the books were open. Judgment is meted out, and it seems to say here that God is not going to. And I think everybody knows this here, but your merits are not going to matter that much. He says he's judging in in righteousness, and he will administer judgment in uprightness. He is going he is going to he is going to hold up the letter of his law, and he's going to say guilty, 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 and he's going to tell you that you're guilty too. The unfortunate thing is for every saved person, we're just as guilty as lost. We just happen to be one of the few that Jesus actually loved. Not that God loved. I actually I think Jesus is the is the is the is the factor. These are my people. I paid for them. I didn't pay for the rest. And that's why I said whenever I talked about perpetual ends, God didn't come to save everybody. If he wanted to save everybody, he would have. But unfortunately, lost person, he didn't. And that should scare you. And I'm not trying to scare people into some type of profession because professions will also lead you to perpetual ends. Profession, I I can profess that I'm anything. There are a lot of people these days that are professing they're an an entire gender different than what they were born as. But that doesn't make it true. But it should scare you. And it does scare you. You know what? Before I was saved, I was very, very scared of hell. Why? Because this flesh understands fire. 
<laughs> this flesh understands punishment. This flesh understands if I don't, if if X doesn't happen, Y is the outcome. And that's about the only only level you can witness at a lost person on because they don't understand Jesus. They don't understand love. Why? Because they've never experienced it. Well, I've had the love of mother. That's nothing compared to the love of someone dying for you. That's nothing compared to the love that, that not only allowed him to die, but the love that said, I'm not only going to die, I'm going to come back and beat it all. If you want to know more about that, tune in Tuesday nights for the sacrifice of Christ in the Old New Testament. <laughs> it's that. Verse 9 says, The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Now, if you think about who, who David was, if this was indeed written at the time of Goliath, David was nobody. <laughs> David was literally a shepherd boy who had no idea that Goliath existed until he rolled down to the battlefield with, that, was it bread and cheese or something for his brothers? Uh, his, his Jesse says, uh, so David, why don't you run this down there to them and see how the battle's going. And when David arrived, there wasn't a battle. There were two armies staring at one another and one guy uh, def uh, defaming God in the valley. And David shows up and says, why aren't we doing anything about this? And his brothers scoffed him. He's a refuge for the oppressed. You know what? I think that I don't think that we are as oppressed as a lot of other places. If you want to know about persecution, there's a lot of persecution that's happening a whole lot worse in other countries than there are here. People are, I don't know if tolerant is the right word, but people are dismissively aggravated at, at Christians in the current state of things. They're definitely not tolerant because you can, Go on any any brand of social media and 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 have your uh, who you are told to you at least in not so many nice words. But the the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. He's also a refuge. It says refuge in times of trouble. When things are going wrong, when things are going bad, under His wings, under His wings, I'm safely abiding. And they know, uh, and they know, and they that know thy name will put their will put their trust in thee, for thou, O Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. I think verse ten is the pivotal verse that led David to his victory over Goliath. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Do you trust in the Lord will lead you to do a lot of silly things, at least to the world. Trust in the Lord will make you quit jobs. Trust in the Lord will make you um, make uh, uh, financial moves that aren't the best for you. Trust in the Lord will lead you to go to places that you've never been to or never seen before. Trust in the Lord will lead you to do all those things. Why? Because thou hast not forgotten them that seek thee. The people that actually seek the face of God, the people that want God to lead in their lives, the Lord's not going to look past them. Those are, those are the sheep that cuddle closest to the to the shepherd when the night gets cold. Right. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me, that thou... Uh, uh, Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may shew forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Now he says here, he, 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 there's a, a quick prayer in the middle of this. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Why? Consider my trouble. I suffer of them that hate me. I think this was all the scoffers at those battles because nobody thought David could do it. In fact, Saul didn't really think he could do it, but he was going to put his own brand of warrior on David, and it wasn't worth anything. Um, and he says, Thou liftest me up from the gates of death. Why? That I may shew forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughters on. I will rejoice in thy salvation. 
Now, I don't think the Lord saves you as in saves your never dying soul every day. I think once that it's a one time experience, people. It's 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 once in a lifetime, and it's forever for a lifetime. But I think we are saved every day. We're a lot of time we're saved from our own selves, from our own stupid decisions, uh, from uh, from the consequences sometimes of our own stupid decisions. And David says, uh, you know, I got a real bad situation here, Lord. I need your help. And why would you deliver me from what is most certainly certain death? Goliath was a warrior. We must not forget who he was. He was for, he went down fairly easily by the biblical account, but let's not forget, he was so formidable that the tallest man and the strongest man on the, in the Israeli army sat on his throne and did absolutely nothing for weeks on end. He was a formidable warrior. And David said, I need you to deliver me from certain death, and why would you do that, Lord? Because I'm going to tell people about how great that salvation is. See, I think one reason we don't get delivered from a lot of things is because we don't tell anybody. Uh, we don't share the glory, of, uh, the glory of God. Remember, we talked about this when we started talking about perpetual ends. Everything has got to give glory back to God. He deserves it. He earned it. He created us. You're his. So he must, and, and why, why would he help people that he's not going to get any glory from? That's antithetical. That, that, that's a waste of his energy. If God needs energy to waste, he rested. So I guess he, he at least has that example. God's not going to waste his, uh, he, he does work inside of time, so he's not going to waste his time with you if you're not going to give him glory. Why did Paul get all the, all the, the, well, Paul made some very specific decisions that led him down the path that he went, but at every turn, Paul gave glory to God in his situation. Brother Christopher also preached about Paul and Silas in jail, and in their most dire of situations, what did they do? They began to sing, probably from the Psalms. <laughs> And they began to sing, and they began to praise God, and that brought great glory to God. And what did God do in return? He helped them. Um, let's continue. Um, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, in the net that they in which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked, uh, the wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. Higayathan, Higayon, Sela. Now, David says that the heathen are going to be captured by their, or they're going to be their own undoing, and I think this actually probably is a direct reference to Goliath because it was Goliath's own blade that took off his own head. Further still, though, um, he says that the the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. You can see the hand of God in everything, including His judgment. I've always said, because I think the, the I think the Lord is capable of a pure version of it, but I think the Lord has an, an enormous sense of humor. I really do. I, if you read the Bible, some of the stuff that happens to people can be down, downright comical. It comes back on them in the worst ways when they go against the people of God. And why does God do that? I think I think it makes Him happy. I think it. And, and if you read this here, it says they fall in their own pits. Their, their feet are hooked in their own nets, and you know the judgment of the Lord. Why? By the way that it falls out for some people. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. H Haman sets up a trap to uh, to have, uh, was it Mordecai hung? And ends up in the same gallows that he set up for Mordecai. Emrod, golden Nimrods. Golden Nimrods for the Philistines when they stole when they stole the Ark of God. I'm not. I'm not saying that that God's sitting on His throne, you know, having a belly laugh. But I do think that He has a level of humor. I think He, he, he He's going to seek glory. He's going to do things that make Him happy. <laughs> and sometimes, what makes me happy is a little chuckle, and I think it makes Him happy too. And I think just desserts, if you will, is a earmark of the judgment of God because He says, "You know these people." He says, "The wicked is snared in his own work." And then there's this word "higayon," which actually is a musical thing for Hebrews, and it actually is a a a murmur. It says, "I think it was a murmur of sounds and like a notes that would indicate like sadness or something." David was. 
I don't know if David was upset or sad for the people that were getting snared, but he did let the people know this is this is this is a serious thing. The judgment of God, however it falls out, and however comical at times that may seem, it's a serious thing. The Lord has passed judgment, and it's working for His own will and way. And then you have the the rest, Sila. So you have this moment, and then it goes on. Uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell. All the nations and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Now the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations shall forget God. We're there. But I think we were there in David's time, too. You know, we, we talk about, well, the, you know, things are so bad, so the, the return of Christ may be here. And it may be. It may be two seconds now, but it also may be 2,000 years from now. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's just as bad as it's ever been. We're not living in the same times that the early church was, where Christians were being thrown in pits with lions and forced to fight the lions uh, until they were killed. We're not to that point yet. So it's not as bad as it's ever been. It's actually better now than it's ever been. But all these people, all these nations, they've forgotten God. That's why there's no sympathy for the heathen out in the jungle that have never heard of God. Because it's not that they have never heard of him. They forgot him. And why? The wicked are turned to hell. They, we're all justly deserving of it. For the needy should not all uh, should not always be forgotten. Now, this needy actually just people that are lowly that that are in need of help. I think I think I think there are people that are spiritually needy. I think there are people that are physically that are physically needy that are spiritually strong. And it says uh, for for the needy should not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor should not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. So David has one last prayer for the Lord before the ending of the chapter. And it's for him to arise and do the thing that God does best. The one thing that man, I think, is truly incapable of doing, and that is past judgment. Righteous judgment. He said, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, Lord, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Now, I don't think this has quite happened quite yet. And I think there's been some comeuppances for some nations but there, if you read all the way back into Revelations, this comes to pass. Every nation of the world gathers an army against Israel. And then there's a thunderclap and a white horse breaks the sky. And there's a man on top whose very words are like a sword proceeding out of his mouth. And he steps down there and he crushes all, grinds his enemies underneath his feet. And then he sits down on his throne and says, now what are you going to do about it? And then the devil says, well, actually, I have a plan. It's going to go really badly, but let's give this one, this one last college try here. And he gathers all of them together again. What a mighty God we serve that can do all of these great things. And what poor, feeble people are we to never access that power. We're so foolish to have not only the owner of the cattle of a thousand hills at our back, not only the winner of a thousand millions of battles, the very creator of the universe, one able to speak and create and destroy with the same word. And we're like, well, I guess we'll just have to get a few extra hours in at work to try to solve this problem. Smart plan. <laughs> Good job. Thumbs up. We, 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 we never use the full ability of God. Why? Because to use the full ability of God means that you're probably going to have to be one with God. You're going to have to be together with Him. And that requires more work than any extra 40-hour week at work can ever put on you because the Spirit, we let it get so weak that it's, it's on life support. And the flesh is so strong, so who do we obviously return to every time? Let's just see if we can power these muscles together and go ahead and build us a tower that will reach to God. All right, are there any questions or comments on uh, Psalms chapter 9? 
If not, we will uh, we will close with that. Um, remember, uh, we have streams on Tuesday and Wednesday for those that are watching. So uh, uh, come join us for those. And if you can, be here for Jarrett's class on Tuesday. We're, we're, we're winding down to the last final moments. If you, if you want to be part of that, this is the time to be part of that. Um, if there's nothing else, we will be dismissed. Have a great week.